thank you so much for taking the time to join me this afternoon. We're so thrilled to be revisiting a summer singing, and I'm so glad you could you could join me today for a little chat. Thanks, Jacob. It's my great pleasure to be with you, and um, I'm thrilled to hear this piece again. I wrote it for Music Intima all those years ago, and I'm really looking forward to hearing it again. You're a trained pianist, and your career brought you fairly early on to singers. The first thing I see on your website is, I love writing for singers. I revel in the human voice and where it can take us. Where did this fascination begin, and, and where did the impulse to write for singers come from? Where it began, Jacob, was in Montreal, where I grew up. I was very, very lucky. There were a number of wonderful singers there. So um, I got to hear them through friends who were older than I was, and they knew professional opera singers. And I went to all of these performances, um, got the um, backstage insight into what it takes to be a professional singer. Coupled with that, I really, really fell in love with art song and uh, Lida when I was studying at McGill and I studied a lot of it. The professors would bring in singers, some young, some experienced, and we'd play for them. And did we ever learn? We learned how to sight read. We learned, you know, a lot about German and French was no problem, but the German in particular, we did. And the whole repertoire. So I have been around really good singers since I was 16. What made me want to start writing for them was, um, as, as you know, I ended up uh, for years and years in the world of opera. And um, if you have any propensity towards composing, um, working in opera houses here and there just gives you such access to great singers, less great singers, <laughs> and the whole thing of what it means to, to produce the sound from inside your body. And I just grew to love them and what they do. I, I don't think it's an easy thing. I think it's very rewarding, but it can't be altogether easy to just get up there and put your own body on display like that. And one thing led to another. I was a rehearsal pianist all over the place for the opera, and then I became a chorus music director, and I was also coaching this whole time. So I got to know the psychology of singers. The love that developed from all of that contact with them has never, never left. So when I decided to go public with composing, um, the first thing I wanted to write was a song cycle. And then the second thing I wrote were the four mystical songs for the late Diane Loomer and uh, Electra Women's Choir. Now I've written over 70 songs and I think 45 of them at least are uh, written to, to poetry of Lorna Crozier, one of my favorite poets, and many also by Joy Kogawa for obvious reasons, uh, my last name being Japanese, and, and then various other poets. Love of the human voice is, it's a gift. You tend to write in song cycles as well. Do you enjoy this larger medium? I do because I love drama. And it's not that there isn't drama in a single song, but I like to also form a dramatic arc in songs. And it's not that the poets have formed these cycles. I maraud their poetry, put them into whatever order I feel will say what I want to say. Then I ask their permission and they usually say yes. and. I have myself a cycle. The music community, especially the composition community, can be quite exclusionary. So I wondered if you'd ever felt like an outsider in your career. Did you feel like that was something you had to overcome? I have not always felt welcomed, but I didn't work at overcoming it. I just thought, well, too bad. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. And what was my driving force was that this was going to be a permanent and composition was going to be a permanent and ongoing part of my expression as a musician. And so I either would have some success in garnering some support from singers and pianists primarily, if they would do my work. Um, and then the audiences and fellow composers would come um, after. Right. And um, I think it's still like that. It is for me, as someone of my generation, I have to, I have to say that the scene now for young um, women who want to be composers is completely different. And um, I like to think that, you know, a few scratches I have on my scalp from the glass ceiling um, helped pave the way for them. 
both as a conductor and of opera and um, as a composer. Um, I hope that answers the question. Of course, it's there, you know. Yeah. I mean, misogyny is there, prejudice is there. Um, but, you know, the even though there are so many atrocities going on in the world, young people now are really saying enough. And if some of those rebellious souls were stopped in 2011 in a different part of the world, then others in North America with various movements here will carry on somehow. Um, and I'm very, very encouraged by how well young women uh, composers are doing. I really don't know if young black composers, both female and male, are having um, better success these days or not. I think so, but I'm not really entitled to say. I hope so. Yeah. What do you think is the responsibility of, of larger arts, arts organizations in that in that context, in that conversation? Well, they have to do their homework. They have to not take the easy way out and, and phone management in Toronto or New York and say, who can play the Rachmaninoff third piano concerto or who can sing this and that. They have to look, if they, if they care about truly representing the society which supports them and in which they live and perform, then I think it behooves them to as I said, do their homework. They do have an artistic standard to uphold. And I will never say that doesn't matter. It does matter because otherwise the institutions aren't going to survive for one thing. But um, <clears throat> the more people of diverse backgrounds and everything else who get a chance to practice their art, the more there will be and the more we will look like the society that we are. So. I guess uh, an arts organization has to look at repertoire and has to search for uh, people that can perform it. And it's more work. Of course, it's more work. Yeah. And do you, do you have any advice for, for young composers today? I mean, you said you're seeing more women composers being more successful perhaps, or, or having to fight less than maybe you did. You were talking about it being really about a relationship with the performer. That's the way I went. Um, I think it's a wonderful part of my career that I've been able to write music for specific individuals. I think any composer will tell you what a what a thrill that is. Um, it, it's a it's a very intimate feeling to be sitting here in my studio writing for somebody else's vocal cords, you know, and psyche, and I, I love that. Having said that, um, composers want their music to be performed all over the world. So you can't just write for a particular person. You have to have a broader um, spectrum in mind. Um, so yes, writing for particular people is, it, it has been my great joy. Um, I think from what I've seen that young composers are very inclined to collaborate these days with more people than only a singer and a pianist, for example. I just think that they're more um, at home with everybody, um, things that somebody my age would, would, would have to think about twice, not before changing my mind, but before uh, making it second nature, are already in their nature. And I think part of that is collaboration. I just, I just see more collaboration. Follow your own path and don't let anybody stop you. It's hard. You're by yourself. You have yourself as your critic. Sometimes you are your worst critic. Even if it's helpful in the end, you can be pretty cruel to yourself sometimes. And then you go and put your piece out into the world and then it's anybody's guess what, yeah. what the reception will be. That's not an easy no. Uh, task. So you have to be prepared for that. And I didn't have a very thick skin at the beginning, I can tell you that. So yeah, you have to keep going. And uh, once you know what you believe in, and you're on 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 your own uh, route, then you have to just keep going. I don't know if you found a difference between writing something for someone that you know you want them to sing versus someone commissioning you to write something. Do you find that your mind works differently as you're writing? My mind doesn't compose differently or anything like that, but I am mindful 
that somebody wants a result and um, there's an exchange of money, which put, which changes the shade somehow. Um, but having said that, um, composers don't earn enough in the first place. So there's never, we're never going to turn down a prospect unless it really doesn't agree with us. I'd say there's a subtle difference, Jacob, but it quickly almost evaporates when you start to compose. Yeah. Maybe a tiny bit more pressure, but that would be all. And then it evaporates. You know, when in doubt, you rely on your craft. That's why composers have to study when we're young and we have to continue to study to listen a lot and go to concerts which is impossible now but at least we can hear some things online so it develops good listening habits do you think your your composition style has changed markedly over the course of your career or? yes my very early compositions had seeds of where i would go but i quickly became pretty dramatic and my music for solo voice is demanding my piano and also the texts that I choose, most of the time they're beautiful, but they're not easy. My publisher years ago said, um, I don't know whether your music's ever going to be top 10, but on the other hand, um, an opera I wrote with Rachel Rose, the Vancouver poet in 2012, and it was performed here in 2013 for the Queer Arts Festival is now, all these 10 years later, going to Portland Opera. So I have a chance to, I had a chance to uh, revise it, reorchestrate por portions of it. So in that sense, my music changes. Um, I would say that um, my music as I went along as a composer got tougher and by tougher in a, in a, in a good sense, not technically speaking, but just have had more meat in it. Um, but then when you get older, you start to not reduce, but maybe a distill a little bit, so that I've written some pieces recently which are complex but not complicated. When I think about summer singing, I realized this was the first text of Lorna Crozier's that you'd ever set. This piece came about because June Goldsmith in 2005, which was just a few months after I had left my position as chorus director at Vancouver Opera to concentrate on composition, um, asked me to do a whole program for music in the morning. One of the things I wanted to do was find some Canadian women poets, and I didn't know Lorna Crozier at that point. So I went to a bookstore, which is sadly no longer with us, called Women in Print, and to the owner, founder, uh, Louise Hager, who helped me um, go through all the poetry books they had. And um, she found me um, Lorna Crozier and I just started looking at them and some of the po poems just blew me away. And I thought for a first choral piece after the four mystical songs um, to do something more contemporary than 10th and 11th century Japanese and Chinese women poets from the courts, I would try this one which talked about a choir even if it is a quote unquote bloody choir. I love the rhythm in her poetry. Lorna came to that concert. We became instant friends and I have marauded her poetry ever since with her gracious permission. And then she wrote me a long extended poem, which is one of the most exquisite things I've ever read. And it turned out to be a, a dramatic scene for a mother and a daughter at which we performed um, two years ago. Lorna is my go-to poet, but I, I do want to um, reach out to other poets because everybody has something different to say, of course. There is a dissertation written on you and her, um, and Crozier is cited in it as saying that you as a composer are, quote, actually listening to the words of the poems and not only to the sound, but to the meaning. What the poem is attempting to communicate and you are enhancing the communication. So when I when I read that, I think a lot about a summer singing, and it really draws into focus how you impart this sort of progression through the text, and the singers and the listeners feel the journey that we've we've been through. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you approach setting, I mean, specifically this poem, but also any poetry. Well, the first thing I always do is study the poem for, relatively speaking, a long time. I like to get on the inside of the poem I, and I, I need to feel its music. There is some poetry that's great poetry, but it's not for me. 
And it's because I can't see or find what I think I'm looking for in it. It's, it's no comment on the quality of the poetry. But in Lorna's, I could find this music. So I say it aloud over and over and over until I really feel that the poem is my friend. And then I think like most uh, composers who work with texts, um, something just starts, it just starts. I don't know where it comes from, Jacob. I, I really don't. But it, 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 I know that I have to begin by learning the poem and uh, understanding how it affects me and how can I enhance Lorna's poetry. I'm not a composer who wants to go quote unquote against the text. Um, I, I've heard of that as a technique and maybe sometimes it can work and so on, but I, I, I don't wanna choose a text to go against it. I like to write to um, give it another home is really what I'm doing. I still want it to sound like Lorna's poetry. And, and when I was working with Rachel Rose on the opera, she said one day, it was really a very charming off the cuff remark. She said, you know, listening to your music with my words, she said, it's like having my mind read. And um, I, I can imagine that. You know, when I see Lorna, because we have since become friends, I say, well, I've been messing around in your head for the last month. I do want to know why that person wrote that poem. Yeah. And that's not necessarily an intellectual coming to understanding, but it certainly is every other level. It's probably intellectual too, of course. And so then the notes just come. Yeah. I have to believe in, in where the poem's going. I have to believe in its rhythm. I have to believe in what it's trying to say. And this one, I just thought this one was so uplifting and had, had different um, parts and moods in, in it. And I did my best to give all of those various modes in the poem a musical vocabulary. Do you find a marked difference in setting something for many voices versus setting an art song for one voice? Oh yes, completely different, completely different. First of all, um, you know, you have as many, as many voices as the choir has as, and as much divisi as is manageable or not. Um, but once you write for a solo voice and let's say piano, I, I'm a piano, so I can hear this whole orchestral thing happening. And most, most of my piano music is, is quite orchestratable because it started off as uh, orchestral sounds in my head. So yes, it's a very, very different thing. Do you think of an ensemble as um, 12 or 40 individuals expressing something or is it still one corporate expression? I think it has to be both, Jacob. I mean, the, the end result has to be one, one deliverance, otherwise it's called um, ragged. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, with a, with a choir as, a, as musically and as personally, no, I'll just say it this way. With a choir as musically intelligent as Musica Intima, made up of a made up of a group of intelligent individuals, then I just trust that this will not be learning by rote, this will not be anything like this. This will be 12 people's understanding coming to understand the poem and what I'm trying to do with with the poem. And then comes the rehearsing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm thinking specifically, so much of the of this piece is um, everyone's speaking the same text, right? But there's yeah, just yeah. those couple, there's those couple passages where the sopranos on their own are listening to somewhere near you in the heart emptied of fear. And then the tenors respond stubbornly in love with itself at last. Yes. I wonder how you decide which are the phrases that you want to draw attention to in that. It seems more personal, almost more visceral when the, the one part stands out on that in those moments. Yeah, I think it's because of the, the line there, stubbornly in love with itself. I just want it to be a, wanted it to be a singular sound there. Yeah. Um, it's probably uh, subconscious. But when an, when an audience hears a sentence like that, um, stubbornly in love, emptied of fear, listen, it is somewhere near you, in the heart, emptied of fear, 
stubbornly in love with itself at last. I just think that uh, that's, we're talking about one thing and the journey that it makes. And I just thought that having a singular sound there would be um, more effective than having a blocked sound yeah. there. I think that's why, because of the text, listen, it is somewhere near you. I wanted, um, I wanted a singular sound there so that almost one group amongst you would be saying, listen to the rest. Right. And then, but because everybody else is also singing something, uh, then, but no, no text is, is competing with it. Right. If, the, if the audience could take away one thing from this piece, what would you want that one, one thing to be? I would want the audience to feel as uplifted as I did when I wrote it. When I first um, was learning the poem and studying it, and then when I was composing it, um, I found it uplifting. And my great hope is that people listening to you perform this and watching you perform it will also feel uplifted. It is why the last section of the piece more directly tonal than the rest of it, because things have to resolve. Not, not entirely, I have to say, right? I left you on a 6-4 chord. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it, because life isn't always direct, yeah. straightforward, black and white and all the rest of us, all the rest of it, but um, it was my way of getting us to the end yeah. of the poem. Major, major chord, but not resolution, just leading the way. Lorna's leading, leading the way by saying, um, begins to sing as if everything you have ever been begins inside to sing. That's a huge statement. And it's so, yes, you know, yes, it says yes. I wanted to say yes. <laughs>